All right, it looks like we have a, a sort of slowdown in the number of people who are signing in, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone very much for being here today. Uh, my name is Bree Reynolds and I'm the Director of Online Content at FlexJobs. Very excited to be hosting today's webinar with Mark Miller of Career Pivot. And I just want to go over a couple housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Mark. Uh, so the first thing is that this webinar will be recorded, so you'll be able to view the video after the fact and, um, and re-watch anything that you wanted to watch again. Um, we'll be making that available on the FlexJobs blog, and you'll also receive an email with a link to be able to view that recording tomorrow. Uh, and uh, this is also going to be a presentation that will include a question and answer session. We kind of do questions throughout the session too, so as you are listening to Mark, as questions are coming to mind, please feel free to ask those, and we're going to try to get to as many of those throughout this session um, and at the end of the session as we can. To ask a question, you have to use your GoToWebinar control panel, and if you don't see that, just look around your screen for a little orange arrow. If you click the orange arrow, the control panel should magically appear, and you'll be able to uh, see the questions area where you can ask any of your questions that you might have. Um, again, please feel free to leave those throughout the presentation. You don't have to save them until the end or anything like that. I know a lot of people get to the end and then they can't remember that question that they wanted to ask. So feel free to type it in whenever uh, the questions come up into your mind. And uh, I believe that is it for housekeeping today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Miller. Mark, thank you very much for being with FlexJobs again. Well, thank you, Bree. It's always, uh, it's always great to be with my favorite partners, FlexJobs. Um, so this presentation, Turning Re Reinvention Failure into Future Success, came out of uh, a mega reinvention conference. I, uh, virtual conference I talked to in January. And so um, what I first want to do is kind of tell you my story and then I'm going to ask some questions of you. So we'll start out with, that's me. I'm Mark Miller. I use, I always joke, it's M-A-R-C, my mama knew how to spell. Um, my mama, I, by the way, my middle initial is R, so my initials are M-R Miller, um, which my mama gave me those initials so I get some respect. It doesn't work. Um, I was born in New York City. I was raised in New Jersey. I went to college at Northwestern. And then I went to work. I moved to Austin, Texas. I spent 22 years at IBM. And I claim I wandered around a lot. Um, all 22 years were here in Austin, Texas. I started out as a programmer. I then went off into quality assurance. I then... Um, I uh, did a IT help desk. I helped uh, about 500 mechanical engineers. I was pulling drafting boards away from them and putting them on CAD CAM screens. I went into training. I uh, then crossed to the dark side and went into sales. I then became an IT consultant, and this is the one I'm going to talk about as my first career failure. Uh, then I went into marketing. And at that point, uh, IBM wasn't a very nice place anymore. And I left to go work for a tech startup uh, named Agira Inc. Uh, I wish I had the logo. We had a really cool logo. Uh, this was in January of 2000. Uh, I then we were acquired by Lucent. Some of you may remember Lucent, uh, which was the Bell, which is the AT&T spin out. At one time, it was the most widely held stock in the world. And oh, by the way, it was the most screwed up company you've ever, I've ever worked for. Uh, we were then uh, Lucent Microelectronics spun out as a gear systems. Um, and then on July 11th of 2002, I had what I refer to as a moment of clarity. Uh, I came down a hill uh, on my bicycle. There's my bicycle after I hit a car head on at 50 miles an hour. That is not a Namby Pamby, um, you know, carbon fiber or aluminum. Uh, frame that is a heavy-duty steel touring frame where it's bent in four places. I spent five days in the trauma center. They had me walking on crutches in three days. I was back on a bike in 10 weeks, flying back to China in four months. Uh, I tore up a knee. I broke a hip. I dislocated a shoulder, broke a bunch of ribs, broke the clavicle, uh, but I, and I had imprints of the pads the helmet my head, but I had no internal injuries and no brain injuries I'm willing to admit to. Uh, which then I went off and laid myself off the following year, went and got a math teaching certificate from ECC, 
Austin Community College, I then did two years of teaching high school math. I have lots of funny stories from this. Um, this was my second career failure. Uh, that is when I got moved. After I came out of that, I got involved with a group called Launchpad Job Club, which is the largest job networking group in Central Texas. Uh, I've been affiliated with them now for 10 years. Um, we put about 15,000 people through our programs there. Um, I then went off and uh, did a one-year stint in the Jewish Community Center of Austin. Uh, the interesting one there is being a non-Jew, being the face of a Jewish organization is interesting. I, I'm glad I did it. I lasted a year, and then I got sucked up into another startup. A high definition video conferencing. And that came to an end very ugly uh, after Logitech bought us and I started my business career pivot. Uh, primarily, I launched that in 2012 primarily to help baby boomers um, with their careers. So that's who I am. And I'm going to talk about several, um, several of my failures in there. Uh, what I'd like now is to run a poll, and the first one is, I want to know how many years of experience do you have? So if you could pull up the poll. Yep, everybody should be able to see that on their screen now. We got a lot of good votes coming in here. Give people another few seconds to chime in. It looks like the winner will be between 10 and 20 years, coming in with about 39% of the vote, and then okay. followed up between 20 and, 20 and 30 years is number two with 33%. Cool. cool. So let's go on to the next poll question. There we are. Cool. So we're, we have a lot of folks who are mid-career, as I like to say, mid to late. All right, the next one's up. I don't know where... Where are you? <laughs> where are you in your career? Or where are you now? What's your current status? All right. And it looks like we'll give people another few seconds to chime in here. We have 0% retired. That one looks like it's holding pretty steady. <laughs> okay. uh, about <laughs> About 60% reporting unemployed, 21% employed looking to change careers, and then 11% re-entering the workforce. And it looks like we've slowed down there, so I'll close that and then share it so you can see that. Yeah, it's the re-entering the workforce that's always interesting because that means a lot of different things. But that, that number always surprises me. So let's kind of get into... Uh, And, and I, what I'm going to be doing is at the end of each of my career failures, uh, I'm going to stop for questions, and we're going to stop at the end. So if you have a question, just go ahead and type it in. Uh, we want to keep this fairly interactive, and I want to make sure I answer your questions as we go through this. To some extent, for some of you, what I'm going to be saying is heresy. <laughs> for those, By the way, I'm 60 years old. Um, a lot of what I learned from my career reflection has been um, defies all the things I was taught. <laughs> so the first thing I want to talk about was uh, when I was working at an IBM briefing center, I was in sales, and manager left, and it was Teresa was the best manager I ever had. And I flatly was seduced. She lured me into go to IBM Global Services to be a consultant. Um, believe it or not, this happens far more often than, than you would think. Uh, I've had a number of clients who have uh, been seduced, and I joke, <laughs> later had to go through bad divorces. Um, so I, I was with IBM, and, um, and the very first project I went on to, believe it or not, was Easy Corp is the only project I ever worked on. Um, Easy Corp is, sh is short-term lending, i.e. pawn shops. And I got in there and I spent the first two or three months and I was, um, I was doing, we were doing, designing a point of sale solution for pawn shops. 
And the more I dug into it, I went, yuck. Because uh, Easy Pawn, basically, at the pawn shops, I loan money at 20% a month. Not 20% a year, 20% a month. Um, it was ugly. It was an ugly business. And I really hated it. Uh, I had been there about six months, and I went, I can't do this. And so the, the issues I had, I came out of a group where I had a great team. And when I got over to Easy Corp, and I was in a, I was in a, on a, this constant swirl of consultants, and I worked with, I joke, I worked with unhappily married people, unhappy divorced people, and unhappy single people. Uh, everyone had miserable relationships, and everybody was miserable. They all traveled too much, and it made me realize just how important my team around me. When I worked in the IBM briefing center, Teresa, my boss, she was tremendous at hiring superstars and then leaving us alone. And we functioned really well. The second thing I learned was um, I am a very value-driven person. And so therefore, my job had nothing really to do with loaning money. But the corporate mission of short-term lending was really ugly and even though it didn't it didn't directly affect my job because I was largely doing a technical job ooh, it made me want to puke and I couldn't do that and I by the way I've had a number of clients where the corporate mission had to align uh, with their with their core values whether they had to do with their job or not and the last was the leadership um, I worked for a young project manager, and when he finally tried to publicly humiliate me in front of my peers, um, and it was over typos in a document I had produced, um, I went, I'm sorry, I'm done, I quit. So the results, the goodness was I resigned from the project in six, fast, six months. One of the things I want you to realize, if you're going to fail, fail fast. I am very serious about this. And this is contrary to the way most of us who grew up in the 60s and 70s were taught. Were taught. You're not supposed to fail. And, and I'm going to give you lots of examples here in a little while of, of people who, who this is kind of it's been detrimental to them. Um, two, I had a plan B. When things didn't work out, I would return back to IBM marketing. And the key piece was that was available to me because I failed fast. And the last piece was I learned a bunch from my experience in consulting. And there are any number of things that I learned there, how consulting, IBM the IBM Consulting House uh, worked basically on methodologies. And what I learned there, I apply in my career pivot today. I'm glad I did it. It was an absolutely miserable experience. I learned a ton about myself. But the key piece here was I failed and I failed fast. And that was really contrary to my, my learnings, my, how I was taught. Now, if you go out to Silicon Valley today, they're going to tell you, fail fast, fail often. So with that, Bree, do we have any questions in the queue? Are you there? Yes, we do. Sorry about that. I <laughs> couldn't sure. get myself off mute. Um, yes, yeah, so one of the questions is, what do you mean by failure? Um, can you kind of give us some def definition around the failure word? Well, when I, whenever you go off into, a, in, into one of these endeavors, you're going to have to determine, how long am I going to give it till I am successful? How do I measure success? 
in in my case, I realized very early on this I, I couldn't do this. It, it violated my values. Um, when I started career pivot, I knew I had to start generating a certain amount of revenue. I had certain benchmarks that I knew I needed to meet. And and so with every with every endeavor, the 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 concept of success or failure, you need to be able to measure. And it will be different. All right. Okay. Um, and then, yep, yep, yep. And the um, the next question that it says is, um, uh, oh, for, this is for somebody who has minimal experience. Um, what sort of, let's see, for someone who has minimal experience, what sort of opportunities should a person look for in a job? Um, so you've tried all sorts of different things. Uh, what are some of your suggestions for you know somebody who has minimal experience? What should they be looking out for when they're job searching? Uh, okay. Um, very often, if if if, if you're um, if you're young and inexperienced, one of the key things is uh, number one is you're just going to try stuff. But two, for many of us. It's more important who we work with than what we do. And so with, with, with minimal experience, one of the key things is go take chances, uh, but be willing to say, okay, that, this doesn't feel right, and figure out why it doesn't feel right. I know I use the F word, feel, um, something most of us guys don't do. Uh, but it's following your instincts is probably more important than anything else. All right, and then one last one last question for this section um, that I think is pretty good. Uh, what if you have no plan B? Um, most people don't start a job expecting to fail, and getting your old job back or a new job is not always an option. So what about for folks who don't have a plan B? Ah, that's where it gets really hard, uh, and I'm going to talk about in my next one when I didn't have a plan B. Uh, so I, oh, I'll goodness. use it. Um, yeah, it's it, it it really makes it hard, both uh, financially and emotionally. Uh, and so that's where and I'll, I'll when I started Career Pivot, I started it, but I also had a side gig doing instructional design. So if I decided that I that this wasn't going to work, I still had street cred with some people that I go back to what I used to do. And so, if you don't have a plan B, and when I went into teaching, I did not. Ooh, that was painful. Okay. All right. Looking forward to the uh, the next section then. Okay. The next section is dream jobs. Beware. <laughs> we all have, I'll, I'll use the example, I had a client here recently says, and he, he works for a financial institution, and he's a, he's a analyst, and he says, I want to go work for The Economist. That would be my dream job. And I said, how do you know that? Oh, that's great, they produce great stuff. I said, how do you know it's not a meat grinder? And he goes, well, I don't know that. So I, I call this MSU syndrome, make stuff up. Uh, he, he just made stuff up in his head. Well, that's what dream jobs are. Um, now, I had my, uh, my bike accident, and I came out of it. <laughs> I was lucky. Um, I, I, within four months, I was flying back to China. Oh, by the way, I flew right back into the SARS epidemic in Guangdong province. We didn't know at the time. Um, so I decided the next year, I said, you know what? I'm going to go be a school teacher. I'm going to go, I'm going to go teach high school math. Um, I'd been teaching adults for 20 years. I taught in 40 different countries. I've been, you know, I was an engineer. They all want me. And the answer is, no, they didn't. <laughs> It was, I have more funny stories of how I, um, I claim I ignored, uh, my expectations were way out of whack. I thought that they would just 
They wouldn't want me. Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, I got rejected from the first alternative certification program. I ended up going to Austin Community College for their first certification program, and it was pretty bad. Um, turns out, I was a guy over 40. They don't want us. Guys over 40 don't do what you're told. <laughs> yeah, I have lots of funny stories. And I talked to some teachers, and they all told me what I wanted to hear. They told me how I could get into the classroom as fast as I, as I, as I wanted. And I thought I had lots of people who would then call, come up to ask me, going, "I want to do what you're doing." And by the way, I got hired, um, and and I thought, "God, this is going to be this is going to be my dream job. This is this is going to be wonderful." I thought I was going to get hired into a school I graduated from. And the answer is, no, you're not. I got hired, well, everybody I talked to um, was uh, white, educated, um, most were suburban raised, uh, they came from two family households, um, uh, they were middle class, and where do you get hired? get hired in large urban school districts with a minority majority populations in poverty. When I was there for the first three weeks, I realized, Toto, I'm not in Kansas anymore. Um, this was not my dream job. When I got in there and I started teaching math, uh, I, was, I had to learn a new, in, uh, a new culture. It was a culture of poverty. And the one thing I completely underestimated was the emotional investment. I had kids I could not help. I had kids who were in the projects, uh, coming out of public housing. I had some huge successes, um, but the emotional investment, um, my first year, I, I barely made it through emotionally, um, and it was rough. Statistically, I was I knocked the ball out of the park. Uh, by the way, no one noticed. I get interviewed my after my second year by a University of Texas professor who said, "You knocked the ball out of the park," and a lot of stories behind that. Um, so the results was uh, my second year. Uh, I got really depressed in the fall semester. Uh, one of the things I totally underestimated was daylight savings time. Um, I got, I was going, once daylight savings time hit, I'd go in in the morning in the dark and I wouldn't come out until it was dark. And that was really hard. Um, and so when I resigned, I was flatly, my big mistake was I did not leave after my first year. I was very depressed, I was very physically worn out, um, and put it bluntly, I needed to take a year off, uh, which I didn't do. I immediately got pulled into a uh, project uh, training for the, the state of Texas, uh, training trainer, which by the way, which was a disaster, uh, very famous project for the state of Texas. And, um, and it was, that next eight months, was absolutely, 10 months, was absolutely painful. I did not have a plan B. I was completely, totally lost. And it took me about six months before I decided I wanted to go, and I said, okay, if I'm not gonna teach, let's go into a nonprofit. And being totally directionless, um, financially we were okay. Um, my, my startup didn't leave us rich, but left us debt free. Um, we finished, fully finished funding our son's college education and he headed off um, as, uh, he, in 2002 he went off to college and that was all paid for. So financially we were in pretty good shape. We weren't rich by any means, but the house was paid for. Um, but this was absolutely painful because I did not have a plan B. So the lessons learned was I should, I don't want to be seduced. <laughs> uh, 
to do, actually go get, understand, do your homework before you walk in. Um, and I really needed to, to take some serious hard looks. After my first year is when I should have quit. I did not. If I had quit earlier, I probably would have had an easier time moving back into high tech if I decided to do that. But I essentially waited until I was totally worn out. Now, since I originally, I did some blog posts on this, and I've, I've talked to a number of people who, um, uh, I met one woman who started a business, of all things, in late 2007. And then she hung on and hung on and hung on until 2011 when she finally shut down the business. And, oh, by the way, accumulating about $40,000 in, in, in loans, which she's still paying off. So my mistake here was I hung on too long. I did not want to admit defeat. And that was a real mistake. And I did not have a plan B. I did not know when I left what I was going to do. So questions? Ms. Bree, do yes. we have questions? <laughs> we do have questions. Um, so one of the questions here is, what is your opinion about telecommuting work and quote unquote dream jobs? Um, there isn't anything else here, but I think this person might be referring to sort of um, seeing telecommuting in and of itself as a dream. <laughs> Somebody working okay. from home, I can definitely relate to that. But what, what's your thought on that, the sort of the okay. conditions of the work as opposed to the actual work? Okay. The key piece here is dreams are rarely <laughs> – dreams are not real. You have to find the reality. And the only way you're going to find the reality is to get out and talk to people who are doing what you are doing, you want to do. It's similar like uh, I've had people who go, oh, I want to get a certification. I say, okay. The value of certifications are really, they're, they're, um, they're for location, the value is based on your location. So the easiest thing to do is get on LinkedIn, find people who have that certification who are who live near you, and and ask them, is it worthwhile? Um, so if you want to telecommute, what you want to do is, it's 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 both people people who are telecommuting, and two people who are doing the kind of work that you think you want to go go do, and talk to them. And be able to um, put things through a filter. That's one of the things I didn't do with the teaching. Uh, I had a lot of teachers who told me what I wanted to hear. I was very fortunate. Uh, I, ha I had two very good men mentors. Uh, one of them I'm still friends with today. My Algebra 1 mentor for my first year. And she laid it on the line when I started having problems. She was really blunt. The, basically, your first year is going to be hell, um, and it was. <laughs> but once I got in there, I, I it, it, what she told me was true. So, Bree, you have any other questions? Yes, we do have another one. Um, how do? You, oh, and that the person who asked that question said thank you. So, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the next person asked, how do you feel about someone taking a temp job or what they call a survival job while actively applying and interviewing for a job that better suits them? What are your okay. thoughts on doing that? Yeah, I've, I've done several blog posts on this here. Re uh, this here recently I did a blog post. It really depends. If you get some value out of it, uh, if there are networking connections or there are skills you're going to develop or the people you're going to meet, I say go for it. The real challenge, one of the things I did back in 2007 when I was first involved with Launchpad, I ran a survey. And one of the things we found was people who took survival jobs, typically a huge percentage, stop, look, stop their job search. And 
one of the challenges, and this is, I, I just did a, um, a blog post on just-in-time scheduling. Um, just-in-time scheduling was pioneered, if you want to use that word, by, by Walmart back in 2008, and now has been picked up by everybody else. Uh, and that's Home Depot, Lowe's, Starbucks, Trader Joe's, anyone who's in the retail business. And just-in-time scheduling allows them to uh, keep people at 30 hours or less, and you don't know your schedule from week to week. Where for most of you, for, for most job seekers, this creates havoc. I've got a client right now uh, who works 40 hours a week for Lowe's. He doesn't know his schedule. We can't get him into a, um, into a community college class because we don't know what his schedule is every week. You won't know, can you schedule to go to a networking event in three weeks? You don't know because you don't know what your schedule is going to be like. Oh, by the way, one of the other issues is if you go to work for Lowe's or Home Depot or Starbucks or any one of these large big box uh, stores, uh, you're going to be on concrete floors all day. I don't know about you, but that kills me. It exhausts me. I used to, when I worked for IBM, I used to, I used to judge trade shows based on the padding in the floor. <laughs> because it just, standing around all day on concrete floors was just, it just, it killed my back. So when I find a lot of times, if when people take these um, uh, survival jobs, uh, when they come home, they're too exhausted to do their job search. So you got to be really careful. There's got to be some value there, and do you do you have the energy to continue to do your job search? Hopefully, I answered your question. Yep, you did. And actually, what you said rang true to uh, another person who said, "Mark, you're so right about the scheduling issues with retail. I did it for five months and had to give it up for exactly the reasons you were discussing." Yeah, it's. I, I said I've got. A, I'm working with a guy on the East Coast who's 60 years old, working at Lowe's. Uh, he can't get out. He's trapped. Now he's working 40 hours, making okay money, um, got health insurance, but he's totally and completely trapped. Exactly. Um, if we can do one more question for this section, sure. I think that would be good, and then we can move on to the next one. Um, what are some suggestions for an effective online search and posting online profiles? Okay. Um, I am a I am a believer in um, something called the targeted job search. Is today so few jobs actually, you know, jobs get filled through referrals. A huge percentage of job gets filled through referrals. So what you want to do is you want to use FlexJobs and other, other websites like it to find companies that are that have the kinds of jobs that you want. And one of the key issues, I want you to look at yourself like a consultant. You solve people's problems. You know how to solve certain kinds of problems. So who has those problems? And start seeking out people at the companies. Um, so by the way, when jobs do come up, they go, hey, Bree, you interested in this? And I'm a believer in doing that long, I don't care where you are in your career, um, building up your network at companies that are capable of hiring you is by far the best way. So can I move on, Bree? All right, yep, thank you, Mark, let's okay. move on. Okay. Okay, my third mistake, I was going to go into the nonprofit world and I'm going, you know, I had various opportunities um, pop up. I said, you know what, I can make this work. And you know, I come up here and says, oh yeah, really? Um, eh, be very, very careful. Um, in, in some ways, my first failure was when I was seduced. My third one is when I seduced myself. 
I decided I wanted to um, go into the nonprofit world and I wanted to go into fundraising. Uh, I'd been in sales, this seemed fairly natural. And I actually went to a nonprofit conference. Uh, I schmoozed with the lady who was running the registration the week up to. She got me the, reg the list of companies that um, were going to be, the nonprofits that are going to be showing up. I had, I had a list of five people I was going to get FaceTime at this conference. And uh, I, I mean, I got it. I had it targeted. And one of them was the, the JCC. The Jewish Community Association of Austin, or the JCAA. Um, I happened to work out there. It was around the corner from me. Um, I'm not Jewish, um, and I thought, okay. Uh, I met the, um, the the CEO, and he was the one who actually who hired me. Uh, they needed. He was brand new, and he wanted to develop a corporate development program, and i.e. Fund, fundraise from corporations. And I said, sure, I can do this. What I did not realize was, number one, nonprofits in general are dysfunctional, and I don't handle dysfunctionality very well. Two, uh, they had a totally ridiculous idea of raising money from, uh, from, the, from corporate donors, particularly here in Austin. Um, it was it, it was a failure and I lasted a year. So number one, uh, if you go work for a nonprofit, nonprofits are cause driven organizations. And put it bluntly, I couldn't I'm not Jewish. Um, working for a nonprofit where it wasn't aligned with my interests was a dismal failure. Um, I had any number of things. Uh, now I was serving on the board, and I was almost president of a nonprofit called the uh, Austin Cycling Association. We were a big uh, bicycling organization. I'm still a big time cyclist, um, and that would have been a, a better idea. I took this going. Okay, let me do this for a couple of years and get gain some experience, and I gained some really good experience. Going to work for the J was not the right thing. Um, I had a horrible time managing expectations. Uh, they did not realize that uh, corporations don't give um, they don't give donations. They're not most are not philanthropic. They want something in return, and they just assumed that these companies would just give us money. And by the way, you know. As it turns out, if you go to most other large Jewish communities, and Austin, this, where I live, Austin, Texas, not have a large Jewish community, um, most of the fundraising from corporations is usually out of uh, small uh, Jewish business owners. We don't even have a Jewish-owned car dealer here. Um, we've got Michael Dell, and by the way, and they said, well, everyone knows Michael Dell's Jewish. I said, no, they don't. <laughs> they don't, no one cares. Um, there were major organizational challenges uh, that they did not, that I did not realize, and I did not, um, I realized at about six months this was not going to work. And the last was, this was an emotional investment. Notice this is the second time where I've talked about the emotional investment. Um, I couldn't put up with it. Uh, I had, uh, I would have been, if I had not quit, I would have been the third person in this, in this position who was fired. Um, I, was, it, I was not going to be successful, and emotionally this was very difficult. So I made the decision at six months I was going to resign. Now, I didn't resign at six months. I resigned at one year. But it allowed me to plan my departure. And it allowed me to start working on, okay, what am I going to do next? It allowed me to say, okay, and, and my decision was to resign um, uh, right after um, our, our, our major fundraising event. What I did was the fundraising event was done. I took a two-week vacation. I then turned in my resignation, uh, giving them a four-week's notice. 
and I timed it. And that was both emotionally uh, wonderful for me. I, I, I even did this when I left my last corporate gig. I timed everything down to the day where I got the most, the best financial. And it allowed me to kind of tie up everything to a nice little bow. And um, uh, it allowed me to, I was, when I left, I was relaxed. Uh, I ended up landing back at a tech startup. In fact, I ended up having three different opportunities just laying in my lap. Uh, and partially because, you know what, I realized early that this was not going to work. It, this didn't align. I wasn't going to be successful. Um, and I started working my, I started working a plan. Uh, again, I determined early I was not going to be successful. And I failed. Now, by the way, I'm glad I did it. Uh, I can't work for a nonprofit. I, I'm, I'm way too impatient. Um, nonprofits' decision making are all consensus based. Um, I, I serve. I, you know, right now I'm, I'm back to being on two nonprofit boards. I was on three. Uh, I'm back backing down to one again, uh, which is Launchpad. Um, I can serve on boards. I can't work for them. Uh, this is one thing I learned learned from this experience, um, but I learned a ton about fundraising, and I learned a lot about um, uh, nonprofit financials, which I use today at, at Launchpad, um, and and I and I've helped a number of my clients get into nonprofits, but I've learned how to say, okay, how are we going to frame this, and what do you have to do to prepare? To go into a nonprofit. So let's go last next to last set of questions. I'll I'll take questions at the very end. All right. So our next questions include um, someone that says, uh, "What would the difference have been if you did decide to take?" that year off of rest. I believe this was uh, something you talked yes. about during your school <laughs> experience. Um, what yes. difference do you think that would have made to yourself and your your experience? Uh, number one, I would have been, I battled depression much of that year. Uh, I put a lot of pressure, pressure on myself. Uh, by the way, I've, I've, I've learned to take care of all my depression issues through diet and exercise. I haven't been on drugs in years. Um, but I was I was worn out. I was exhausted. Um, and there are times where you have to realize if you go in, and by the way, teaching is an exhausting job. It's believe it or not, when you go off to teach, you are doing something you have never done before every single day. And you don't get to do it again for one year. It's exhausting. So if I had taken the year off, I probably would have made the next transition with a whole lot more clarity. And I probably wouldn't have gone to work for the day. <laughs> I would have found another nonprofit uh, that was willing to take a risk on me. Another question. Yeah, clarity. Clarity definitely sounds like yes. something that would come out of that. Um, this question, there have been a couple people asking, how do you reinvent yourself for each new career field? Um, you seem to easily switch from different fields without a problem. Okay. Um, go read my blog. Uh, number one, the key piece is every time I've made a career transition, I have made what I call a half-step career transition. In other words, I had one foot in the old world, one foot in the new world. In other words, it wasn't this big, huge leap. Uh, it was a pivot. So, for example, I'd been training adults, so I went to teach adolescents. Uh, is it different? Yeah, it's pr actually pretty different. It's a lot more different than people think it is. But it's not this vast leap. The second piece is I, every time I made one of these pivots, every time, there has been a relationship that took me across. In other words, I never did it alone. 
and I always learn to rely on someone. When I went into teaching high school math, I happened to have a really good Algebra 1 mentor. I found an Algebra 2 mentor. I actually had a teacher, uh, Jenna Haley. She was across the hall from me. She was I was old enough to be her dad. Um, and she'd been teaching for three years. And I went into her classroom and said, do I have your lessons plans, please? And for the whole year, I stayed two days behind her. And why two days was the fact that I could, if I picked up her lesson plans, if I didn't understand something, I could go down and watch her. I sucked it up and realized I didn't know squat what I was doing. So notice that every one of these transitions, it's not quite as drastic as you think. Going into fundraising, I'd been in sales. It's not that big of a leap. Although the fundraising people will tell you it's a huge leap. It's not. So, Bree, you got any other questions? Uh, yeah, a couple more here. Um, let's see. How do you suggest we address failure um, and job or career changes during an interview? So, assuming we accept that we are going to fail and that we should fail fast and yes. Um, and all that. How do you address those in, uh, in okay. job interviews or during the job search? By, uh, by, by be able to carefully chronicling what you learned. And because all of these you learn, you, there's, there's vast amounts of, of, uh, of both information and things about yourself on when you fail. And, and the key piece, failing is no longer, uh, a horrible thing. I mean, we've gone through so many, well, these last two recessions, these last 15 years have been pretty brutal. And as long as you learn something every time, and I can cry, I can tell you um, from each experience, the things I learned, it's rather interesting. Um, my experience as a teacher, I can, I can give you root cause analysis of 95% of the problems we have in the schools. I can't tell you how to fix any of it, but I can tell you why the problems are there. I, I have insights that I, I could not have gotten, and that's valuable. Now, if you didn't get anything out of it, wow. Then, then you can't address it in an interview. Okay, Bree? Hopefully that answers it. Yep, I think that makes sense. And then another question um, for this section, and then we'll get to more questions towards the end, is, um, oh, where did it go? It just slipped out of my screen. Um, oh, so the, the relationships that took you across from one job to the next were most new through networking um, or people that you already knew from previous experiences? Well, it varied. Um, a lot of them were from... Um, uh, from existing from existing relationships, some were cultivated. Uh, one of my most valuable uh, one of my most valuable connections when I went off into teaching, believe it or not, was my chiropractor. And that's one of the things most people don't think about. You have a lot of relationships that have nothing to do with work. Um, my chiropractor, I, I joke, she's the other woman in my life. I've been with her. God, 25 years. Um, she knows my values and she knows a lot of people. Uh, I see her every two weeks. And so, uh, believe it or not, one of the, one of, for those of us who are a little bit older, uh, one of your most valuable connections is your children's friends' parents. Uh, I will be coming out with a post. Um, next week in a white paper, it's, it will be a new chapter in my next book, my next chapter, next version, uh, next edition of Repurpose Your Career on weak ties. Um, weak ties are people you may have known in the past but kind of lost contact with, but you know them. Um, this might be someone you worked with 10 years ago. Uh, it might be your parents, your, your kids' parents, or your kids' friends' parents. Somebody you kind of know, 
the difference is they're more valuable than strong ties because they run in really different circles than you do. So the answer is it varies, but very often it's um, the people who you know really well are often the least va valuable to you because they know the same people you do. So can we move on or you got another question? No, I think that's great and a really, really good thing to uh, to learn there. So yeah, let's go to the next section. Yeah, go, go look for next next Monday. Uh, I'll have it. So one of the big problems we have in our society is failure is not an option. I tell you, that's total BS. Um, for those of us who grew up around the space program, and by the way, my, my daughter-in-law works for the Smithsonian, so we get to go up and I get to go go into the Air and Space Museum regularly. Um, they live up in DC. And um, this was part of the culture. You don't fail. I'm sorry. That is not an option. Well, if you're going to fail, fail fast. And again, I'm going to give you two examples. I had, uh, I have a very good friend who um, bought a staffing agency in December of 2007, a staffing franchise. You want to talk about lousy timing. Um, she closed it in the fall of 2008. She realized this is not going to work. She took her losses, found a job as a recruiter, and went on. Now, at the same time, um, when I did a lot of these blog posts, I had some a lady who came get started a business in 2007 and decided she wasn't going to fail. That was not going to happen. And she hung on and hung on and hung on and just accumulated way too much debt. And she's paying for it today. So if you're going to fail, fail fast. And again, always have, you know, I, I have had a lot of people say, Oh, I can't have a plan B. That's setting up. You're up for failure. No, it's not. When you start off to do this next, th whatever this next thing, whether it's a job or a business or whatever, go ahead and set some goals and set some some time frames. Um, one of my favorite books that I put, use with clients after they've taken a job is a book called The First 90 Days. You should be able to determine the first 90 days where this is going to work. You know, it's kind of like when I walked into the J. In the first 90 days, I knew this was not going to work. Now, it took me six months for me to actually make that decision, but I knew it in the first 90 days. I made a mistake. And the key piece here is always, 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 what did you learn from it? From every one of these experiences, I gained insights into me, into their business. Um, as I said, I still use uh, I I use what I what I learned uh, from IBM Global Services was immense, and I still use that to today. What I learned in teaching, I learned a bunch of stuff about myself. Two. Um, I will probably eventually run for a school board position. Um, it's important to me. Um, and, and even from the J, I still use a lot of what I learned about fundraising um, and the legalities of it uh, has proven invaluable. So you got to figure out, okay, if I'm going to fail, what did I learn? And as long as you learn, and when you go into the interview process, you can talk about the things you learned. That's more valuable, and by the way, that's positive. You grew out of failure. So, before we kind of wrap up, let's, let's, take, let's take some final questions. All right, definitely have some more questions. 
Um, what about for the folks on the call who are unemployed, so they've gone through the failure? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. What if they've already failed? How can they sort of apply the same concepts that you're talking about, or what are some other things that you do for them? Yes. Okay. Um, if if and and again, don't look at what why you're unemployed necessarily as a failure. Is learn how to turn that positive spin on. Um, I've got a blog post. That he, I call him Steve, in 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 this white paper that's coming out. It's actually I've got a, uh, I've got a blog post called the introverted, Intro, introverted sales guy job search, is a blog post, and it was about a gentleman, fifty nine years old. He sold equipment that packaged food, and he got laid off after twenty years of selling this equipment. And one of the things we did was, is we branded him. Um, and two, we went after all, I had him dig through his weak ties, big time. And, and what he was surprised at was the more he reached out to people, people he hadn't talked to in 15, 20 years, people were going, yeah, I'm willing to help you, yeah. And one of the things I claim is in the, this last 50, last two recessions, so many people have been touched by unemployment. It's massive. It's probably 60, 80% of people in this country either have been unemployed or have someone close to them has been unemployed. People get it. Go talk to them. You're, and he was, Steve, was really surprised how much people were willing to help him. Two, we used um, LinkedIn uh, company pages to find adjacent industries. And again, I got a blog post on finding adjacent industries. And, uh, and it's using the company, LinkedIn company page and looking for the pages um, that says, you know, it'll also tell you, you know, if, if, if someone looked at this, this page, they looked at these other pages. Uh, where he landed was at the company that made sensors for the machines he sold for 20 years. And he got in there because someone he worked with 15 years earlier. Try doing that with a, almost a 60-year-old guy, trying to, find a, trying to find a sales job. So the answer comes down to is, is work your weak ties. If, you know, in his case, we went back and looked at all his successes and spun those. And so, again, depending on what happened, um, is learning how to do the lessons learned and pull out the positives. All right, great. Um, we have another question, and I think this is probably something a lot of people have experienced. Um, this person says, I stayed in a position that I enjoyed for an extended time. Um, but I'm now being told that I'm either overqualified for uh, that current position, but they've never held the next position, so they're not proven. It's sort of that catch-22 where you're stuck in between. You have too much experience for your current level, but not enough experience for your next level. How do people in that situation, um, what are your tips for them? Yeah, one of, this is, this is, this is the key. Um, for those of us who grew up through, uh, you know, I, again, I worked for IBM for 22 years. I went to work for them in 1978. They had, you know, they gave training for us. They did all this wonderful career development. By the way, that's on you now. So one of the key pieces, if you need to get to the next level, um, either number one, go figure out how you're going to get the training you need to get to the next level. And by the way, it's probably not at your current company. One of the challenges we have, and I, <laughs> we have a lot, we have a lot of folks who are what I refer to as institutionalized. <laughs> if you remember Brooks and from Shawshank Redemption, um, you, you've stayed too long, and so it's figuring out number one. Okay, they're not going to train you. To get to the next level. Okay, how are you going to do that? Is it getting on lynda.com? Is it going taking classes at the community college? How are you going to do that? 
and put it very bluntly, very likely you are going to look more attractive to an outside employer than you will inside. That's, that's the problem of getting comfortable. And I left IBM after 22 years because, um, well, they, they screwed me at my pension. Um, but two, um, there wasn't any place for me to go anymore. So I left. And I had a lot of people going, you're leaving? Really? You're eight years from being able to retire. Yeah, I wouldn't have lasted eight years. Uh, so the answer is, it's very likely you're responsible for it now, and you're going to have to figure out how you bump up, bump yourself up to the, get to that next level. All right, thank you very much. And I know we've come to the top of the hour, so Mark, I want to give you a chance to get to the next slide and talk sure. about how everybody can find you. I know we have a lot of questions that have come in that we haven't been able to get to. I'm sorry about that. But I do know a lot of these topics are covered on Mark's very extensive blog. So I would definitely recommend going to careerpivot.com and searching for your topic because I bet you he has written something about it. Um, and yeah, so check that out. And Mark, thank yeah. you so much for being here. Yeah, so um, if you the first link on the page is a set of blog posts that covers a lot of what I talked about today. Uh, my Facebook page, it's lonely. Like it. Um, Again, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, just tell me that you were on this webinar. Um, I have two books out there, uh, one on personal branding for baby boomers. It's ebook only. And then my Repurpose Your Career, a practical guide for baby boomers. Again, I will be releasing a second edition of this uh, early next year. Uh, um, I, have a, I have one sample. If you um, sign up for my blog, uh, subscribe to my blog. You will find you will get the first sample chapter. Um, there is a. I will be releasing a second sample chapter next Monday, and um, uh, and we'll do. We'll be doing a blog post on that. And with that, um, feel feel free to email me. I am Mark M A R C. My mama knew how to spell at careerpivot.com, and uh, you can follow me on t on Twitter. Um, so with that. Um, I made it exactly on an hour, so that's very good. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, as always. Um, really good tips and advice here. We have a lot of good comments coming in, thanking you for your help today. Um, sure. And for everybody else, thank you so much for being here. We wish you all the best of luck in your job searches. And on behalf of FlexJobs, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day, everybody.